In April, 1792, a young French soldier sat down to rest with his company near Straussburg along the Rhine River. Intending to write a letter to his family at home, he instead began composing a poem, which would soon be turned into a song that he and his fellow soldiers would sing about their call to arms in defense of their homeland. That song, La Marseillaise, would become the French national anthem. What does it mean to become a nation? How is that identity shaped? And when you construct the nation, who is left out? Today, we're going to unpack that rising nationalism of the 19th century Europe, and we're going to explore how that leads to Italian and German unification and influences a new wave of imperialism across the globe. Hi, everybody. My name is Todd Beach. I teach AP European history at Eastview High School in Apple Valley, Minnesota. That's a suburb of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And I'm Katie Lancey. I teach AP Euro at Coral Gable Senior High School, which is in Miami, Florida. Welcome to AP Live Review. We're excited to have you here with us today. And um, as we're going to start every session, we're going to kind of go over our purpose for why we're doing these reviews with you these two weeks. Um, our purpose is to supplement what you've already learned all year in your AP European history class. We're gonna expose you to essential content. Um, if you've been tuning in with us so far, you know we rushed through some pretty big pieces quickly, but hopefully reactivating what you already know about. Um, we want you to engage in our homework. The homework's really geared towards you being familiar with all the pieces of the AP exam. And we're gonna unpack responses to help you be better prepared so you can compare how you did with some of the responses that we're showing and we want you to be as prepared as possible. We also want you to feel a sense of community. Um, the exam is right around the corner and you're not alone. You're, there are students all over the country and at international schools all over the world that are getting ready to take this AP test. So we're glad you're here with us. We want you to tune in and practice and you know, be the best that you can be. Thanks, Katie. So here we are, we're in session six, and our content review is going to be nationalism, rising nationalism throughout the 19th century, new imperialism, and our skill development's a very, very important day because we're going to look at the micro of a DBQ, the kind of zone in on how do we source evidence, sourcing and attribution of documentary evidence, and we're going to look at that and give you a homework to do some DBQ, some, some of that DBQ evidence. Speaking of the DBQ, that's session seven. We're going to, you got to tune in because we're going to structure the DBQ and we help you prepare for that exam. And then session eight, we've got a lot of exam format and reminders as well as quite a bit of content to pour through in session seven and eight. Okay, Katie, do you want to start and take us through our homework? Yeah, so we gave you a, a multiple set, a stimulus based multiple choice set. And you can see here on the screen, we're starting with exactly what you, we want you to start with. We want you to go straight to the source and have a, have a thought about what the source is. We have this French economist, the, an essay, and we want you to think about the time of this essay, which is 1881, right? So our last session, we were talking about industrialization, and this really goes hand in hand with the end of that time period. So if you wanna read along with me, the thesis that the condition of the worker has improved during the last quarter or half century does not require any more proof. What can we say about his leisure? Is the worker of today a greater slave to his work than in the past? The evidence of the facts and figures allows us to give an unequivocal reply. The working day has been reduced to a level that makes it more humane. In the recent past, for we are referring to a situation with, which existed only 30 or 40 years ago, a working day of 14 or 15 hours was not unusual, both in home-based as well as factory production. Nowadays, the duration of work is not more than 12 hours, and even that is much too long. French law has fixed it at this figure. Swiss law has reduced it to 11 hours. In England, it is down to nine and a half hours, and it is probable soon in the whole of Europe that the effective working day will be reduced to 10 hours or to 60 hours out of the 168 in a week not through legislation, but at the request of the parties concerned. The facts that we have put together show quite clearly that all classes of the nation have participated in the general progress and that the working class has particularly benefited in the triple sense of an improvement in their material well-being, an increase in security, and the growth of leisure. 
All right, so we've got, again, this is a lot of response to the things that, that Todd and I went over in our last session. And then you have this set and Todd's gonna go over the questions with you. So here's our multiple choice set. There's the question. And I know you've seen these because you were looking at the homework. You can pause the video here if you didn't have a chance to do the homework and then we'll give the answers in, in just a second. And the, the, the question is, the changes in working hours described in the passage are best explained by which of the following developments in the late 19th century? Pretty typical to start with a multiple choice that just kind of talks about, you know, what's going on in and around this particular passage. There is our response. And this is straight from AP Classroom. So you can see the rationale or the reasoning why D is the correct response. Question two, the impetus for the labor reforms described by the author are best understood in which of the following political contexts? So think about that. You're not just talking context, but political context. Pause the video here and read through the responses and then make your choice. You can see the correct answer is A, and that gives the rationale for you, which you can read through. Question three, by Lewis dismissal of legislation as an effective means of changing work conditions is best explained by the continued influence of which of the following in the late 19th century. Pause the video here and consider your response. And there you can see the correct answer and the rationales for that. So we hope that this going through these multiple choice sets uh, was helpful to you as you prepare for the AP exam. Okay, today's content learning, 19th century perspectives and political developments. You can see we're in 1815 to 1914. That is the third period of the course. And we're gonna talk about nationalism and unification today. So explaining factors that resulted in Italian unification and German unification. And it's kind of funny because we're in my class, we're always talking about how we, the United States, as a nation, not necessarily as a culture, but as a nation are actually older than Italy and older than Germany mm -hmm. as it comes to that kind of unifying aspect of nationalism. So let's see what factors resulted in these two unifications today. We're going to start with Italy and nationalism and Italian unification. And this gentleman here seated on the left is Count Camillo Benso di Cavour. And so I'm always asking students, my gosh, if he's Count, what does that mean? It means he's of noble birth, an important person. He's of Sardinia and it says he's a statesman, which is another word for a politician. He has these very limited and realistic national goals. He thinks unity only for the states of Northern Italy, maybe Central Italy. He doesn't think Southern Italy uh, can be a part of it. So he's being really realistic in his ideas about what Italy can accomplish. He thinks it will can all be done in an expanded kingdom of Sardinia. So in the 1850s, he's gonna work to try and consolidate Sardinia as a liberal constitutional state. Think about what that means, constitutional state, meaning we have a constitution, what type of constitution? Is it going to be a constitutional monarchy? Will it be more of a republic? He wants to lead Northern Italy, and he's going to successfully build support for Sardinia through a program of highways and railroads, civil liberties, and opposition to clerical privilege. Now, you have to think about that in the context. It's Italy, where the seat of the Catholic Church is. And so these are going to be, in some ways, they're somewhat populist ideas, but in some ways, they're really practical and realistic ideas. Cavour realized Sardinia could not drive Austria out of Northern Italy without a powerful ally. So that piece of information alone, we have to understand its context, right? Austria occupies part of Northern Italy. It helps him actually, it helps his cause because those in Northern Italy speak Italian. They don't speak Austrian or German and they don't want Austria controlling them. And so he's gonna reach out to Napoleon III and seek a secret alliance with him. And the alliance is, hey, we're going to have this little battle. I think it's going to happen. And when we go to war, do you have my back? I kind of, we're going to need some French troops and support to make this happen. And so I have this word here. He goads Austria, right? It's like the person that kicks sand in someone's face at the beach and is going to start this fight. He goads Austria into attacking Sardinia. So it looks like Austria is the aggressor. And then in comes Napoleon III's forces to try and help and Austria is eventually defeated. Cavour is gonna eventually return to power because at some point there, popular opinion back in France is, is against this. They don't like this idea of France meddling in Italy. 
many in France are Catholic, all, you know, pretty much all of Italy is Catholic, and they feel like this is, could be kind of a, an undermined attack on the church. So it's unpopular, and what happens is Napoleon III has to withdraw troops, withdraw support. Um, Cavour resigns in a rage. He's upset by this, but the Italians continue fighting, and they defeat the, the Austrians. And long story short, they defeat the Austrians. Cavour is going to then come back. You know, all of a sudden, hey, I'm back. And thanks for winning that war in early 1860. He's going to gain the support of Napoleon III by giving Napoleon III Savoy and Nice to France and achieve his original goal. Then he's going to get it. Northern Italian state. When the people of central Italy are going to vote to join the northern Italian state, we have an enlarged kingdom of Sardinia under the leadership of Victor Emmanuel II. Now we're going to have, what do we do about the south? We have the, the north and the central. What about the south? And this dapper looking gentleman on the right is Giuseppe Garibaldi in his red shirt. Okay. He is the son of a poor sailor. He believes in nation. He believes in republicanism. And he personifies this idea of the romantic revolutionary. 1860, he has a guerrilla band of a thousand red shirts. They land in Sicily. Think of in your mind's eye of the map of Italy. You've got the boot. And then the toe of the boot goes to the island of Sicily, right? Like the, the boot kicking the ball. And 1860, they land in Sicily, capturing the imagination of the peasantry who had revolted against their landlords in Sicily. He outwits the royal army. He wins battles, gain volunteers. They take Palermo and they've won Sicily. And now there's nothing left to do but to take the rest, right? Garibaldi and his men cross the mainland. They're preparing to attack Rome. And then we have to take a pause. Why might that not be such a good idea? Think about authoritarian power as we've learned about it through the course. And Cavour quickly is going to send forces down there to occupy the Papal States, but not Rome, outside of Rome, because they want to intercept Garibaldi. It's one of those what ifs of history. I'd like to have sat at the table and listened to Cavour, although I don't, I don't. I don't know Italian. I'd have to have a translator. I'd like to sit there and listen. I'm sure Cavour is saying, hey, you know, if you go after the church, it's going to, no one's going to like that. If you're going, and maybe it's not the church, but Rome, they, they strike a deal. Cavour is afraid of Garibaldi's radicalism. He knows that Garibaldi is popular. And he says, how about you join the kingdom of Sardinia, which we've already organized, and we leave Rome out of it for now. How does that sound? And so that's what happens. The conquered territories, they'll have, they'll organize a plebiscite or a vote. Hey, should we join this group and have this constitution together? The people of the South vote to join this enlarged kingdom of Sardinia and Garibaldi and then Victor Emmanuel, the king, ride together through Naples, cheering crowds. They symbolically seal the union of North and South of Italy, monarch and nation state, and the parliamentary monarch under Victor Emmanuel II is neither radical nor democratic. Although it's politically unified, there's a growing social and cultural gap separating the progressive industrialized North from the stagnant agrarian South. I tell students that it's similar, not same, but Italy is similar to the United States in that the North is industrialized, the South is very agrarian, and they, they, they have very different views about what they should do. So that brings Italian nationalism. Now let's focus on Prussia and German unification. And I really like this image of Bismarck because it's a young Bismarck. He's a Prince Otto von Bismarck. He's of a noble Prussian Junker family. And I like this image of him um, compared to some of the images when he's much older. Wilhelm I will inherit the Prussian throne 1861. And he sets out to reestablish Prussia's power introduce reforms in the army. So he calls for an expansion of the army through military draft. We're gonna modernize the weapons. And you know that to do that, it's gonna take money, which means he has to tax citizens. So Germany, the industrialized, as Germany starts to industrialize, the power of the middle-class liberal party grows in Prussia and is really resentful of the conservative influence of the army and that younger class, both oppose reforms of the king or the Kaiser, and this creates a deadlock and a constitutional crisis over military spending. And so Wilhelm is going to bring in Otto von Bismarck. 
Bismarck is made prime minister 1862, comes into the position with, uh, with widespread diplomatic experience. You know, he's a good diplomat. He's a, he's a guy who gets things done. And that's why Wilhelm wants him. He declares that Wilhelm's government will rule without parliamentary consent. So that's pretty bold, but they control the army. Addressing the opposition, Bismarck will use the expression iron and blood, Eisen and blut, to describe how the great moments in history are decided through conflict and warfare. But Bismarck's phrase was meant to assert that wars decide the major events of history, and it was delivered as an appeal for the Prussian parliament to increase defense spending. He went on to collect taxes through the bureaucracy. Even though the budget had not been approved by parliament, he collects taxes anyway. He reorganizes the army and wages three separate wars to unify Germany. I have a little lag. Here we go. He is the master of realpolitik, taking advantage of opportunities they present themselves. 1864, Denmark would incorporate, I love saying this, Schleswig and Holstein into the Danish kingdom, provoking a joint war with Prussia and Austria that's short and successful against Denmark. So they win the Denmark war. Afterwards, the joint occupation of that territory also creates conflict. Bismarck wants Prussia to control the territory. Prussia then is going to go to war with Austria in 1866, the Austro-Prussian War, and it forces them out of German affairs. So they win that war. Then they're going to annex the states of North Germany, and they create the North German Confederation. So we're starting to see some organization to this. And it's the southern, very Catholic German states that are not included and Bismarck is going to convince them into an alliance if there is ever a war against France. And so southern German states are like, well, of course, if there's a war and France is the aggressor, we, we are going to be there. And so Bismarck's thinking, yeah, I, I just need to convince France to be the aggressor. Bismarck is going to manipulate a war against France, easily defeating the French in the Franco-Prussian War. And they take the French, French provinces of Alsace on the rain, 1871 then. The German Empire is officially declared. Wilhelm I is the Kaiser, 1871. And here's the thing. This image is really, really telling about this. Because the proclamation of Wilhelm as Kaiser of the new German Reich. And basically, it's like, we beat you, France. And now just to kind of rub your noses in this, mm. we're going to have this big event at your very sacred place, the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles. And so that's this image that you see, but trust me, the French are not gonna forget this, uh, kind of foreshadowing for you what happens much later in history. Okay, now we've oh. unified Italy <laughs> and Germany, and it's up to Katie to, to bring us European- <laughs> In 10 minutes. Um, all yeah. right, so you're seeing the learning objective on the screen and, and really looking at the motivation, uh, that led to European imperialism. In that same period that, that Todd was just talking about, 1815 to 1914, which is our period three. So of course, economic motives play an important role in the extension of political empires, especially for the British. Um, the British empire was losing its early economic lead and facing competition in foreign markets. And each European power saw colonies as crucial politically as well. They saw it as it's something for national security and for military power. Um, an example of this is the Suez Canal. It's an important role. It's an important part of Great Britain really needing to control that and occupying Egypt. It cut the travel time to get from Great Britain to India by such a huge amount. So having that strategic piece there was really important so they could get to that crown jewel of their empire. Um, many people were also convinced that colonies were essential just to be a great power. And we see that that um, reflects both the fact that there's a lot of aggression in European nationalism and theories of social Darwinism that are an ideology that's pretty pervasive and is talking about sort of a brutal competition among races at the time. So these are all ideas, economics, political and ideological reasons for wanting to go into uh, imperialism in the 19th century. Um, another factor was the industrial world's unprecedented technological and military superiority. We have the rapidly firing Maxim machine gun. We have quinine that's gonna help to control malaria. 
And then something I talked about in our session on industrialization, we have that second industrialization, a uh, second industrial revolution where we have the telegraph and we're really being able to connect parts of the world. So all of this technology is also really key to how industrial uh, imperialism is possible during this time. Um, conservative political leaders manipulate colonial issues in order to divert popular attention from class struggles at home and to create a false sense of unity. Todd was just talking about nationalism and this, this sort of glue that keeps people together. Um, imperialists also develop additional arguments to satisfy their conscious, consciences and answer their critics. Um, a favorite idea of Europeans was this idea of sort of a civilizing mission and the, the idea that they should bring civilization to more primitive non-white peoples. So um, on, you can see the image there on the right. That's an example of technology um, that we have quinine now to combat malaria, which is really what makes going into places like the interior of Africa possible during this time. All right, so imperialism in Africa. Um, you can see the map there. This is a map that shows the uh, Africa after the Berlin Conference, which we'll talk about in a second, and where the different European powers are going to eventually begin this process. And then there's another map that will show you that by 1914, all of um, Africa, except for two very small places, has been colonized by European powers. So um, imperialism in Africa begins with the International Congo Association in 1878. Leopold II of Belgium will finance a syndicate under his personal control, and he'll send the famous explorer Henry M. Stanley to the Congo, and Stanley will go throughout the interior of Africa, signing treaties and making trading stations with African chiefs. Um, these African chiefs are signing away their entire villages, all of their resources, and they, they neither read nor write and have no idea what they're signing. Um, Leopold's intrusion into the Congo after this tensions mount and European nations as in, are, are gonna be struggling. They're gonna see that they want their share of these valuable natural resources. So the idea that anytime there's not enough to go around could create a conflict, we're gonna see Otto von Bismarck, who, who Todd just talked about, um, wanting to keep the peace and arranging for the Berlin Conference, 1884-85. And the conference will recognize Leopold's personal rule over a neutral Congo free state and agreed to work towards stopping the slave trade in Africa. Um, European powers then pushed into the interior of Africa so that no one power would be able to claim the continent. And of course, we know now about the atrocities committed in the Belgian Congo, but this was the, the guise or the, the veneer that, that Leopold went into the Congo under. Um, you can see there the image there that's on the right. Um, this this is a, an image of the Berlin Conference. Um, I think it's always interesting to point out the, the fact that there are, is only representation really from the powers in Europe, that we are missing a lot of voices sitting at this very white table. Um, the British already possess the largest empire in the world. There's that very famous saying, the sun never sets on the British empire because it's so vast um, and has valuable territory, Egypt and South Africa. The completion of the Suez Canal in 1869, as I already said, made Egypt vitally important to the British because it really did shorten that route so that uh, the Great Britain did not have to go around the Cape of Good Hope to get to India. It also advanced to the Sudan. France solidified its claims on much of West Africa, acquired large portions of North, North Africa, which had vital resources such as iron ore and petroleum. And by 1882, France was in full control of Algeria and had taken over Tunisia to, present, uh, to prevent both of those countries from falling into Italian hands. And in the sea, Bismarck, who we just talked about, he had little interest in colonies, but he uh, pursued an imperial policy to improve Germany's diplomatic position. And so Germany had acquired territory in Central Africa in 1890, and the location in Central Africa also blocked Great Britain's hopes of creating a railway from Cape Town to Cairo, so in connecting those two valuable pieces of the British Empire in Africa. All right, so for today, we're going to have Todd go and he's going to do a really awesome thing with the document camera to talk about this very important piece of the rubric you're looking at here, 
which is the analysis and reasoning, one of the two points on the document-based question. And it's a part that my students, I think, particularly struggle with at the beginning of the year. And I think that Todd's gonna lay it out for you in a really nice way, and we're gonna give you some practice for homework. So from the rubric, you can see, you have to, for at least three documents, explain how or why the historical situation and or a purpose, historic uh, point of view, and our audience is relevant to an argument. And Todd and I use an acronym, and, and your teacher may use something similar, um, but we like happy. So we talk about in class, we're going to make the source happy. So you can see there, there's the, the little gr component grid there, and we have a, a, a reason for that that we kind of like when you're having to write the actual DBQ. And when you're using documents as evidence in the essay, it's important to demonstrate both attribution and use an in-text citation. And we'll show you um, on tomorrow's homework a good example of a student who did a nice job with this, but we want you to make the source happy. So Todd, if you want to, thank you. Um, we're going to introduce the source using attribution stems, right? And there's some examples on the screen there. You can say according to or the statement issued by and give the author's name or the author's name shared his or her or their perspective. Um, number two, we want you then after you've introduced the source, we want you to describe the content of the documents of the source. We want you to, to tell us about the source in your own words. And then we want you to end with one of these uh, things that satisfies that D part of the rubric. We want you to use, uh, to use and explain the historical situation, the audience, the purpose, or the point of view of the document. And for all four of those, we want you to end with the why and tell us why this is important or significant. Why does it matter? So it's more than just the H, the A, the P, the P. It's those letters along with the why. It's really important. And that's how you get the point for this particular skill. And then just a nice best practice. And, and Todd and I, who are both part of reading these essays after you take the AP test, we want you to uh, conclude by sourcing and including the document number in parentheses at the end. This is just something that makes it really clear to the person reading your essay that you're using this document and it's a really nice best practice. And so that's something I want you to get in the habit of doing. So you're going to introduce with attribution, explain the document in your own words, and then follow up with this happy statement. And you can see here in the little kind of grid here, that a really nice way when you're starting to think about documents and to do it kind of quickly on the fly is to make this cross and go, go around and start to think about which of the letters you might want to use and why that letter and what you're going to say about it is significant. And Todd's going to follow up. He's uh, made a chart. So I definitely suggest that you have a look at the homework today because I think that some of the questions that he has in his chart will really help you to wrap your head around what this skill is asking you to do. Todd, do you have anything you want to add here? No, I think you've gone through that really well and I will get to their example and they can do some practice. Okay, great. So we're going to source the DBQ and we, as Katie mentioned, it's one of the points on the exam for the DBQ, explain how or why the document's point of view or purpose or historical situation or audience is relevant to an argument. And so we're going to go through a sourcing activity using the document camera. So I'm going to share that screen. Okay. And so this will be something that's in your homework for today. And you'll have a chance to see it. This is something that we work well on with our students. We have taken what was the 2009 DBQ and we've kind of revised it and redesigned it because the 2009 was a different type of form and different exercise. And we've designed it for AP Live Review. So evaluate, and we've reconstructed this prompt, evaluate whether European acquisition of African colonies in the period 1860 to 1914 was motivated primarily by economic or political reasons. So one of the things that when you get to the DBQ, that you're gonna see a structure similar to this for the prompt. And we'll teach, we'll go through this more tomorrow, but we'll, one of the things when you're reading, and just doing your pre-reading of the DBQ is it'll be divided into a couple categories. And so as we read, we wanna make sure that we are making a T-chart. And as we read the different documents, we can then start organizing. Do we think this one fits more as a political reason or an economic reason? and we'll make a little T-chart and we'll go through more of that tomorrow. 
Let's just try to focus in just on the micro though, instead of then in the large DBQ, we'll just focus on just sourcing. And so this is gonna be document one. So as you read a document, you want to annotate and think about it. This is then Prince Leopold. He's heir to the throne of Belgium. He's the future king. And he's having a conversation in 1861. We don't know with whom the conversation is, but we do have a record of it. And so it's really important to closely read this and I kind of annotate because we can pull information from this to really work on our analysis. Surrounded by the sea, Holland, Prussia and France, our frontiers can never be extended in Europe. Ours meaning Belgium, right? But the universe lies in front of us. Steam and electricity have made distances disappear. All the unappropriated lands. I find that interesting. He thinks they're all for the taking, right? Mm -hmm. On the surface of the globe may become the field of our operations and our resources. So just alone, that tone is really entitled. Like we, these are unappropriated. They're not claimed by Europeans. Therefore, they're up for the taking. Since history teaches that colonies are useful, that they play a great part in which that which makes up the power and prosperity of states. Power to me is playing for political reasons. Prosperity to me is playing for economic reasons. So, so far, I wouldn't know quite where I want to put this document because it could fit in either one. But let's continue. Let us strive to get one in our turn. Let us see where there are unoccupied lands. That's so curious, that statement, like they don't belong to anybody but us. Where are to be found peoples to civilize? So again, that Katie talked about some of the language of imperialism that they were using to lead to progress in every sense. Again, that kind of idea of imperialist idea that we are gonna come in there and thank goodness we're here to help them. Meanwhile, assuring ourselves the opportunity to prove to the world that Belgians are also an imperial people capable of dominating and enlightening others. So there's a lot of language in here that we can work on. When you start to source, we're going to interrogate that document. We have this little chart here to help you with that. One thing we want to make sure that you understand is that you don't have to do all of these. You pick one avenue to do your sourcing. And you can see we're using this because we want to make the document happy. There's our H, our A, our P, P, and then the Y. Why is this significant? Okay. So for your homework, you, we're just going to ask you to pick one area that you want to source with. But for this practice, let's just see what we can do. And I'll just put it on a few bullet points. So when and where was the source produced? What events at the time might have affected the author's viewpoint and their message? How does the context affect the reliability of the source? So we know it was 1861. We know that he, that Leopold, this Leopold is an heir. And as an heir, he has ambition, right? Because he's, he's talking about that up here. We also know that it is before the Berlin Conference, which Katie talked about. And that was when they decided the rules. When I say they, the Europeans decided the rules of who and how they would go into Africa. Okay, and so the other thing as far as situation is there's the continually uh, this idea of civilizing and progress and this imperialistic tone that's going on in the, in the message. So I've just given myself a few bullet points that I can refer to if I'm gonna write sourcing out in a much fuller exercise of the DBQ. What about audience? It's interesting because it's just a conversation. And so there's nothing in the source that really tells us who the audience is, but we can imagine or speculate mm -hmm. the audience and who the audience might have been. So the audience is probably somebody who Leopold is trying to convince about his ambitions, right? 
It could have been Stanley for anything that we were talking about, as Katie talked about. Um, others in Belgium with similar ambitions. You know, right? Todd, if you, if you don't mind me jumping in here, I think Please that do. a lot of times students find this to be really hard because they can read the document over and over and the answer is not in the document for many of the happies. The answer is in their ability to think about the document and to mm -hmm. really, that I see that word speculate. They have a hard time doing that. And if their speculation is reasonable and explained, then they're, then they're doing a good job. And this is really frequently a point where we wanna see their ability to think about the sources. And so this is sometimes really challenging for them because thinking about it's not there, we're not, we're not telling them who the, who the conversation is with. And so they have to really think and that thought needs to be rational and it needs to be explained why whoever they're gonna identify as that possible audience would matter in the terms of the content of the document. So yeah, right. the speculation really is hard for them, yeah. Really helpful. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. And so with my students, we talk about using stems to kind of get into that by saying the audience may have been because we don't know, but we have a fund of some knowledge about what happened. And so we can anticipate and speculate some of that. What would be the purpose? Why would Leopold say such a thing? Why was the document created at this time? Again, the time is 1861. How does its purpose affect its reliability or usefulness? How would a historian use the source? See, and I think this one is really helpful. If it's in 1861, a historian would say he's kind of, he's laying out a political agenda for himself. You know, you, again, we don't have Leopold here to tell us exactly why, but we can speculate that he's kind of laying out this political agenda. You kind of go and you make these ideas known and you, get, you garner support and it would be that they're going to, you know, they do go into the Congo. They eventually will, Europe will recognize that they've already had that. And his idea is that his purpose is he really wants Belgium to be recognized as a power. You know, they want to be seen on an equal plane as France, Germany, um, Great Britain, and the rest. They want that kind of status, that kind of support, that kind of popularity, that kind of um, respect. So respect could be one of the purposes, as well as some others that he's talked about in the document. Okay. Point of view is the other P. What's the author's point of view or positionality? What are the beliefs might the author have? There's a lot of language in here that kind of, when I talked about tone, these unappropriated lands and his positionality, unappropriated lands, unoccupied lands. And I would probably think about pulling some of that tone as well as his position, oops, position as an heir to the throne. His position as a noble member of the aristocracy or an, 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 an aristocratic, you know, a member of the aristocracy where, you know, he's, he's not, he's had a lot of things and privilege in his life. And you can see some of that kind of showing up in the tone that he's also putting out. And then, so why is this significant? Again, I'm going to just remind you, you don't have to do all four. We're just walking through all four as a practice, but you do pick one and then you must talk about why it's significant. That's because we have to analyze. That's the word that keeps showing up over and over again in that rubric. When we say analyze, you have to talk about the how, the why, or the because. And so one of the stems that I ask students to use is, this is significant because, and that gets you into how, why, or because. Why is this significant to the prompt, to the argument you're making? So if you were making an argument 
about political reasons. This is significant because it's evidence, you know, you can use some of the language um, that he has really had political ambitions as an heir to the throne, something along those lines, but you need to talk about how or why or because and get that stem, I really think helps you to, when you say this is significant because. Katie, anything? Yeah, no, I think that's great. And, and to also remind everyone that in the rubric, and I know you can always back the video up and look at that first piece we started with, the rubric requires that you go beyond simply identifying the things that are in H, right? It actually says that. It says that you have to, rather than simply identifying the H, the A, the P, the P, you have to really do the why also. So, so have I really like that stem? This is significant or this is important and something so that you're relating what you have identified when you've identified who the audience might have been or what the purpose might have been or what the context was, then you're explaining why any of that matters. So the H A P P, but along with the Y. And again, sometimes at the AP reading, we see students who think you have to do all four letters. I don't really think you have time for that. And you can do whichever one that you want and you can change it up for different documents. If you're more comfortable, it doesn't really matter as long as you've done it three times correctly in the essay to get that point. Okay. We're gonna go back into our presentation and I hope that you found that really helpful. Is the presentation on the screen okay? Yep, absolutely. Okay, and you wanna talk us through our homework? Yeah, so, so what you were looking at with Todd and the document camera was one of the documents from that DBQ. And so there are other documents that, that you have the opportunity with that same chart. If you use your, your phone and the camera and you look at the code, or you can type in the tiny URL, there are several different documents that you can go ahead and try any or all of the HAP letters and try your hand at, at doing that and also making sure that you include the why and you tell us why it's important or why it's significant, why it matters. And so you have several different documents that you can choose and we'll start our presentation tomorrow with giving you a nice example of someone who incorporated that document into the body of their essay and then also did a correct HAP and that's right before we're going to do the structure for the full DBQ with you tomorrow. So tomorrow is super important. Great. Thank you, Katie. Okay, so this was session six. We sped through nationalism and new imperialism, the skill development. Again, we're working on that, that skill of sourcing, and we hinted at the attribution of documentary evidence. You really encourage you to do that homework because you're going to find more examples of this activity in there. Session seven is we're going to go through the world wars. Um, that's going to be interesting, <laughs> trying to get through that and structure this document, the DBQ for you. And then session eight, we'll finish out what is the final unit, unit nine, uh, Cold War, Contemporary Europe, and we'll also do exam format strategies, reminders for you. So make sure you're tuning in for those. All right. Katie, you know, when you're trying to work yourself towards that AP exam, it's like climbing a mountain, isn't it? And do you know what, what did the mountain climber name his son? What did the mountain climber name his son? I don't know, Todd. What did he? Cliff. Everyone knows this. Yep. You yep. would name, the mountain climber would name his son Cliff. Of course. Yep. Of course. They're getting worse and worse and worse. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Everyone take care and we'll see you tomorrow to go over that DBQ structure. So tune in.